Aaron Van Wordham, how's everything going, man? Good. Back again. <laughs> Back again, indeed. Uh, when, I, when was I, the I last you time? Not too long ago. It was uh, like two months ago, to maybe. Talk about some other stuff. Uh, but obviously, you've written a new book since then. I actually bought uh, uh, like a preprint copy or something, number nineteen of twenty-one, if I remember, of uh, uh, of the uh, book that I ended up reading on the Kindle. Uh, but uh, yeah, tell me, tell me about this book because. Um, for me, uh, uh, you know, I, I've obviously read it, but for my audience, what's it about? Why should they read it? What, what, what were you thinking when you wrote it? Yeah, well, thanks of all, Jimmy. I just want to say thank you for encouraging me to write the book. <laughs> you, you've been doing that for years. You, you <laughs> w w wouldn't get off my ass about it. So I, I appreciate that. Mm. I finished it. Uh, yeah, and you bought... So what you bought was the raw manuscript basically so i mm -hmm. i had this limited edition print of the book 21 copies uh, at bitcoin amsterdam mm -hmm. and that was sort of before my editor joe wickin book went over it who made it mm -hmm. you know he he made it look actually nice <laughs> so to say <laughs> um but yeah so that's what you bought and now the actual book is published mm -hmm. called the genesis book the story of the people and projects that inspired bitcoin mm -hmm. and it's really you can see it as the 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 prequel to bitcoin uh, <laughs> that's that's a way to think about it it's the prehistory of bitcoin it's mm. uh, it, it tells well as the subtitle suggests the story of the people and projects that inspire bitcoin so what that means is before bitcoin there were other digital cash projects and there mm. was there were communities especially of course the cypherpunk community that were trying to create digital cash and even mm -hmm. before that, there was the cryptogra uh, cryptographic revolution. Mm -hmm. And there's ideas on uh, separating money and state going back to Hayek, for example, most mm -hmm. notably, was a significant part in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so the book tells the story of h how, it all le how it all happened, how, how Bitcoin came to be, where all these ideas and technologies sort of came from. And what I kind of hope to what i wanted to achieve with the book is sort of if you are someone who knows a lot about bitcoin mm. li like yourself mm. uh, then hopefully it's interesting to read about this prehistory like mm. i don't know if you personally would have learned many new things but i'm mm -hmm. sure there are bitcoiners out there that would learn new things about the prehistory it's not that well known mm. but also if you know nothing about bitcoin like if you're new then I also hope that it could be a very good way to sort of get into Bitcoin, to, to understand it, because I sort of explain Bitcoin in this very step-for-step -step way of like, what is public key cryptography? What is proof of work? What are, and, mm -hmm. and so it's the book sort of builds towards Bitcoin. So hopefully it's also a way to just understand Bitcoin if you don't understand Bitcoin yet. Yeah, and uh, and that's something I really appreciated about the book is that um, you you not only go into the uh, technical history, right? The cryptography and like uh, e-cash and, you know, be useful proof of work and all, all this crazy stuff that people tried. But you also go into the economic history. And I, I've said this before, like for the techies, they don't really understand the economics. And for a lot of economics people, they don't understand the technical stuff. And th this book really brings both of them together. And um, and just for the record, I did learn a lot of things in this book that I didn't know. And I, I've studied this stuff uh, quite extensively and I've, uh, I've written articles on it. Uh, so I, I really appreciated, um, you know, sort of like the melding of both of those things, because um, I think if you're if you're like a programmer or somebody, then you don't necessarily know like what sound money is or the history. You know, you go all the way back to Mises and uh, even before that. Um, and uh, go through like the history of economic thinking and you know what central banks are and stuff like that. And for uh, sort of the Austrian economists, uh, you know, you get to know like you know public key cryptography and you know Duffy Hellman and Ralph Merkel and the cypherpunk mailing list and all of that stuff. Um, and it, it really puts to bed this idea that Bitcoin kind of came out of nowhere and that we could improve like all of these things with it because there were all these other projects that happened. So can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, how far this history goes and how long this development took? Because I think for a lot of people, they have trouble understanding, OK, well, Satoshi Nakamoto just came out with something in 2009 and it's uh, it just sort of had its 
it's miraculous, uh, you know, immaculate birth or something like that. Whereas uh, what, what you argue in the book essentially is that, no, this is the culmination of, you know, decades, maybe even like a couple of centuries of economic and technical thinking that, that, that took a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, nice that you say that indeed, mm -hmm. even today in the Bitcoin community, you still mm -hmm. see these two cultures sort of, you mm -hmm. see, it's just, as you said, you have mm -hmm. the techies that mm -hmm. sort of come to Bitcoin for the tech mostly. Mm -hmm. And then you got the, yeah, the more economically or the monetary reform mm -hmm. type of, uh, you could say digital gold box, maybe mm -hmm. sort of these types that come to Bitcoin sort of from a different direction. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get the feeling that the two sides don't quite level, don't quite understand each other. Both mm. sort of feel that they have a stronger claim to Bitcoin in a way, maybe. Mm. And, and yeah, I do think that Bitcoin really came from both of these cultural reform movements, so to say. Mm. There's really these two cultures that did exist separately mm. in the past. So indeed, like the the hacker culture, and mm -hmm. then there's the uh, yeah the Austrian economics uh, mm -hmm. side of the story, and these were really two completely different subcultures, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's really through the extropians and the cypherpunks that they start to merge, and ultimately, I argue, this leads to Bitcoin. So it's like this marriage of these two mm -hmm. subcultures, and that's also yeah how I wrote the book. Essentially, it starts out with two different storylines and throughout the book, they merge and it becomes one storyline later on in the book. So how far back uh, it goes, my, so the economic side of the story is mostly told from Hayek's perspective. Hmm. So Friedrich Hayek, the, econ the economy, Austrian economist. Um, and he started, well, he was born in 1899, but he started becoming sort of relevant writing about economics and money sort of in the 1920s 30s mm. and then the tech side starts with the emergence of hacker culture so that was the 60s the 1960s mm -hmm. uh, the the austrian side does sort of have some flashback parts mm -hmm. in the in the book as well what goes even a bit further like mises indeed or menger so that's mm -hmm. like 19th century and there's mm. even some, like, what was before that? What, what mm. did the economic discipline look before that? So if you wanted that, there's some flashbacks. But the main mm. story, yeah, it starts um, around, like, 1930s and then the other in the 1960s. And mm. then it, the sort of chapters oscillate at, until you get in the, well, it ends in 2009. Well, mm -hmm. it ends, there's also a slight sort of fl flash forward in 2011 of Satoshi leaving. That's still in mm -hmm. the book. But mm -hmm. the main, yeah, it's it's basically 1920s, you could say, to uh, the invention of Bitcoin. So yeah, the book, the, the sorry, the book ends where Bitcoin begins. Mm -hmm. It's 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 really written as a prequel in that sense. Like it's not about the history of Bitcoin. It's not about the early years of Bitcoin, with some minor exceptions. But it's really a origin story of of Bitcoin, so to say. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you you mentioned that there there really are sort of like two main storylines, and one one co obviously comes from uh, the Hayek's point of view, and the other one I would say like is uh, you know I mean it, it kind of starts with like uh, the hacker culture goes through like Whitfield Diffie and Merkel and Shamir and you know all these names that mean something to me, but maybe not to your audience to to like uh, you know the typical person reading this sort of stuff. Uh, but let, let's talk about those two cultures a little bit because yeah, uh, can I say Austrian something about that real quick? What's that? So, yeah, so can I say something about that real quick? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the book is written a little bit like a passing of the baton. Yeah. So it's there's not one main character mm -hmm. except for sort of the spirit of Bitcoin is sort of the main character and how it mm. forms throughout the book. So there's different kind of protagonists for each chapter, and there are some mm. recurring protagonists, especially Hayek. But mm. then each chapter has like a new main character that sort of drives the idea to the next step sort of yeah yeah and and that's something i by the way i really appreciated about the book because you you um it's told from a particular perspective and uh and you you can you can sort of like empathize with each character and give uh you you put like a 
a lot of three dimensionality into each character, like where this person came from and what they were doing and what they were trying to do um, and uh, what they were trying to achieve, the people that were around them and, and, and so on. But uh, but let's uh, let's start with sort of like the economic side. Um, you, you trace through from Manger to Mises to Hayek. Hayek ends up being like a major focal point in this story. And uh, at, at least uh, my reading of the book, you, you sort of like cast him as a little bit of a tragic figure because he he has this idea of wanting sort of like a, a, an ideal money. And it keeps he keeps getting thwarted by his nemesis, Keynes, at like every turn. And then towards the end, like you see, like he sees maybe a little glimmer of hope. And then like he never quite gets to see it he reminds me of like an old testament prophet right like that's saying okay like things are gonna get things are gonna get better things get are gonna get better and then gets killed before the actual better thing comes so tell me a little bit about hayek and um and how you see his influence i guess within austrian economics and in bitcoin in general yeah so the book kind of starts with you could say the the big debate that Hayek had with Keynes, mm. um, and, and this was based on the the Great Depression and the mm. the Wall Street crash that preceded it. And Hayek had s- certain ideas about that. He thought it was caused by um, artificial interest rates mm. and th- how that caused a misallocation of resources. And he believed that the economy should really be run if you want to call it run in a in a bottom bottom up um you know emergent way a, mm. a, a free market way mm. uh, let individuals based on their subject subjective preferences make their economic decisions mm. and then in a very decentralized way the optimal configuration will mm. emerge while keynes he stepped in after the great depression and he said no the government needs to you know basically spend the, the economy out this recession, the government should take a very active role. So he had a very top down vision. Mm. So it, it was really this big debate between bottom up and top down, essentially. And Hayek lost that, that, that debate, but I'm putting lost very much in quote, quotation marks because he, it's more that he lost the popular vote, if you will. Mm. Like his ideas were less popular. I don't think he was wrong. And that's what makes him tragic. Or I mean, that's mm. my opinion. That's mm. my reading of what happened. Uh, I think he, his analysis was the right one, but it was such an unpopular message to tell people, no, the government shouldn't do anything. You need to let the market sort this out because that would have been a very painful recovery. Mm. While if the government can sort of do its thing and just spend the economy out, out of a recession, that sounds very easy. But Hayek said that's not a sustainable thing, that that's not a real solution. But Keynes' idea was much more popular, so he sort of won. Mm. Now, that was kind of, a, kind of a devastating blow for Hayek, so much that he even sort of retracted from economic writing or definitely monetary writing altogether mm. for like decades. Mm. So this was like throughout the whole 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, basically, he was not writing about monetary economics at all. And then in the 70s, actually, he uh, won the Nobel Prize. So that was mm-hmm. a big uh, revindication of his, for him, he, he, that, that actually That, that was him. like 1976, around there, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, or post 70... stagflation, like during or... stagflation, so like when, when his uh, economic theories are a little more vindicated. Right, yeah. yeah. Maybe it was 74, but then, mm-hmm. uh, anyways, around that time. Um, so, and at that point, he comes back to writing about monetary policy again. Mm. And this time, he feels like he really sort of found the solution. And the solution is to let money itself to the free market. So the government should not be involved with money at all. It should just be a free market phenomenon. phenomenon. And mm. just like the rest of the economy, that way, the best form of money will emerge it will be voluntarily adopted by individuals following their subjective you know optimal economic strategies that's how the best money will emerge so you don't need the government for that mm-hmm. but again this idea was it was kind of ignored i i would almost say like so even though hayek's ideas about the economy were vindicated 
and they were brought into the mainstream also by um, notable politicians like Reagan in the United States and um, Milton Friedman and yeah to uh, Friedman and mm-hmm. I, what's the British uh, Iron Margaret Lady? Thatcher Margaret maybe. Thatcher mm-hmm. yeah she was a big fan of Hayek's work so at that point these ideas were now accepted in the in you know society and in the, among the elites but the idea of denationalizing denationalizing no <laughs> I have trouble with denationalizing denationalizing uh-huh. I'm getting there it only took five tries <laughs> denational I'm going to give up and denationalizing once, yeah, once I did it five times wrong it will go wrong another 20 times before I <laughs> before I pick it up you could just spell it out that's fine yeah, yeah. all right I, I'm not going to try again you 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 did it perfectly. Mm-hmm. So um, these ideas were still not uh, being picked up, mm-hmm. except by this sort of fringe group mm-hmm. like the Extropius and the Cypherpunk. So they mm-hmm. they were actually very interested in, in this idea, and they sort of started to run with that ball. Mm-hmm. Now Hayek uh, then after the seventies, so in the eighties, this is actually before the Cypherpunks, I should note. Mm-hmm. Now he had another idea. Because when he uh, published the denationalization of money, he he sort of advocated for a sort of social movement to realize that. Because mm. of course, the government, governments, the state needs to allow that. <laughs> while the state mm. is also the one that benefits from <laughs> having an effective monopoly of money. So obviously, very uphill battle. But Mm. in the 70s, Hayek still thought that would be possible. Mm. But then in the 80s, he sort of wised up, you could say, or he he became disillusioned that that was going to be the way forward. His ideas weren't being picked up broadly. So then he had this new idea of, no, people need to create a money, a free market money that the government cannot stop. That's this famous quote of Hayek, Mm -hmm. which is also the opening quote of my book. Mm. Yeah, it is the opening quote of my book because it's really the story of Bitcoin or the story of my book, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's Hayek thought money should be left to the free market. Governments won't allow it. So people need to create something they can't stop. And then you had the cypherpunks, these technologists, they were building technologies that governments can't stop. So they picked up this ball and they 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 ran with it. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, and it's it's he's such a tragic figure in the book for me because had he like just survived another twenty years, I think he would have actually been very excited about Bitcoin. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, someone like Rothbard, uh, th- despite you know him being sort of like an Austrian economist, like uh, par excellence and stuff like that, um, you know, I, I talked to people like uh, Jeffrey Tucker, and he thinks that Rothbard. Would have hated it, right? Like it would have mm. would have hated something like Bitcoin because uh, you know he wasn't necessarily capable of understanding all of the technical aspects and such, and sort of like brings to mind that um, you know it, uh, there there is sort of like um, uh, you know the, these two threads that you really do need to understand to get Bitcoin, and uh, economics is just sort of one aspect of it um so let, let's go backwards a little bit uh well before that like uh what one of the big characters uh or one of the things that really struck me in the book was this hiatus that he took from writing about economics uh, I, I think you mentioned the 40s 50s 60s even even part of the 70s and uh, and really what seemed to turn it around at least uh from my reading of your book is the Nixon shock because, you know, Nixon famously said, we're all Keynesians now, right? And he, he did all of the stupid Keynesian things that, uh, that you know, everyone, you know, at least supposed conservatives weren't supposed to do, like price controls and suspend, uh, you know, doing the Nixon shock and suspending gold convertibility and so on. But that, that seemed to be the point at which, like, economic uh, you know, I guess standard Keynesian thinking started to um, started to you know, fall out of favor a little bit, um, and obviously the decade of stagflation sort of completely put that to bed. Um, what do you think replaced it? Because uh, you know that that that's like post seventies. You you started getting, I guess, more Hayekian thinking with uh, Reagan and uh, and Thatcher and maybe even Milton Friedman and so on. Um, but you know the, this sort of like Keynesian thinking se- seems to have persisted 
despite all of that uh, stagflation. So, like, are we still Keynesians now, or is it like modern monetary theory? What what's what's sort of been the uh, the justification, if you will, from uh, the status side to you know continue printing more money? I guess. Yeah. So when Keynesian Keynesianism mm -hmm. was basically disproven, that's the mm -hmm. way to put it, because Keynesians, Keynes itself, his, himself was not around anymore, mm -hmm. but Keynesians had this theory that you can't have both inflation and high employment, mm -hmm. but then we got stagflation, so we got exactly that, and Keynesian mm -hmm. theory was sort of disproved. So at that point, Hayek proposed his denationalization of money, but what really kind of took over economic thinking was monetarism. Mm -hmm. So that is actually Milton Friedman indeed. Mm -hmm. And the way I would sort of describe or summarize that is that he adopted a lot of these Aust Austrian ideas, like Hayekian ideas mm -hmm. about how the economy should, how the government should stay out of the economy, how the free market should be let free. However, the important exception is that he did not include money in that. So he kind of had a Keynesian idea about money. Now, the difference was that Keynes thought that the state should be the one to sort of invest in the economy in, in times of a downturn and in that way, you know, spend the economy out of this downturn. Um, while Friedman, he had more this idea that, no, the free market can do that itself. And so lowering interest rates, so it makes it easier to spend, that, that's actually... That, that in itself is the tool. So money was still kind of this Keynesian tool, even for a very non, otherwise non-Keynesian economist. But it's interesting mm. that that part of Keynesianism persisted. So yeah, Ra Hayek is a much more pure Austrian in that sense. Mm. While Friedman is just not, I would say, like but mm. because money is obviously such a big part of the economy. It's a major mm. part of the economy. Uh, everyone who listens to this podcast will know. Mm. So it's almost strange that such a big part of the economy is still sort of Keynesian, mm. uh, but somehow the popular idea is still that Milton Friedman is sort of this free market absolutist, but but he was not. There's, <laughs> there's, there's definitely these influences in there. Yeah, uh, in many ways, the monetarists take the worst part of Keynesianism and adopt it for themselves so that they can justify government spending and so on. Um, all right. So let, let's go on to the other part, the hacker culture. Um, I, I found the, um, that part of it absolutely fascinating, the origins and stuff. Um, can you tell, tell, the, tell my audience, uh, you know, what, what hacker culture was and how it started and, um, you know, how it sort of evolved and, you know, the, the various factions that came together to eventually form the cypherpunks. Yeah, so hacker culture emerged at MIT, mm. uh, like I said, mm. sort of late 50s, but mostly 60s and 70s mm. as well. And at this time, computers were new, right? Mm. Computers were these super expensive machines that filled a room. No one could actually afford one except for an institution like MIT or uh, mm. some other universities had like a computer or maybe <laughs> at some point two computers or, but you know, it was like this very scarce resource, but this attracted a certain type of students. They got very interested and fascinated by these machines and they really wanted to, they had this urge to, to, to understand them and to, to uh, utilize them and to leverage the power of these, these computers and so they started to, it became like a social club kind of deal where, where they became friends and they would all come to this computer often at night when no one else was using the computer, no one else at the university. So there was the, the nightly sessions where they were just experimenting with this new machine. So they learned to program and, um, and, and a particularly like smart way of programming, of solving a solution was called a hack. So that's where the term hacker comes from. They were hackers. They were they were figuring out how to cleverly use these machines. Um, what's important about this is that because this computer was a shared resource for them and because it was sort of this social thing, they were actually learning together and working together. So they were sharing their code with each other, sharing what they were doing, contributing to the same program. So they were it was this very collaborative um philosophy basically 
that that they were using. Now, at some point, the the computer revolution sort of um, commercialized. It became an actual thing that people could buy. I think that's what it came down to. So computers were started being sold, and software was started. And importantly, software software was starting to be licensed. So you couldn't that that ethos of freely sharing the code and 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 working together collaboratively that was sort of being attacked if you will by these commercial parties you know the microsofts uh of this world and uh this culture was even sort of creeping into these computer labs at MIT where they were starting to think a little bit more commercially and they wanted to maybe license their software and then Richard Stallman he really strongly disliked this idea. He was strongly opposed to this. He had seen what sort of the future could look like, uh, this collaborative uh, anarchist um, way of working. He, he saw the potential in that and he wanted to preserve that. So then he started the free software movement. And the free software movements, for one, started to... Um, Stallman himself, he started to develop GNU, so that's free software operating system. And the idea is that all software should be free, where free means uh, free as in speech, not as in beer. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Yes, uh, free as in freedom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where was I? What was my train of thought here? Was Stallman? Uh, yeah. So uh... the the important thing here for Stallman was that closed source software. There's sort of an in- inherent power structure, namely the user of the software has a is so, sort of reliant on the developer. Like the developer can include features in the software that the user does not know about. So the software can spy on the user, for example, just or, mm-hmm. or you know, in other ways, do harmful things. So the user is completely disempowered in that case, and the developer is sort of in charge. So Stallman believed that software should be free and he believed that the user should be empowered and should be able to know what his computer is doing at all times. So that was sort of this freedom ideology in there, which is, of course, very relevant for Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin today could not work without free software. We need to know that there's only 21 million Bitcoins. And the only way we can know that is if the software is free. Hmm. Now, from this free software movement also emerged the open source movement, Hmm. which was a bit more pragmatic. So they rebranded because they were a bit more pragmatic and they were less against proprietary software, so licensed software. They were not necessarily against that, but they just believed open source software has benefits, like quality benefits. It's actually a very good idea to share your software because that way anyone can contribute, anyone can find bugs, fix bugs. So it's not just this freedom ideology it's also just if you want to produce good software it's also very pragmatic so that's what they started to push more it's sort of this rebrand which richard mm-hmm. Stallman still very much hates he still wants everyone to call it free software but people today in general call it open source software so that's sort of the rebrand and then the other interesting aspect about open source software is to to name that to use that ideological uh sort of uh side of it is that it works best if there's many contributors to a project, right? Mm-hmm. You want good quality, so then it helps if more people can find bugs and fix bugs and, you know, test All bugs software. are shallow with enough eyes on it. Yeah, that, that's exactly. the quote that you used several times, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, now, in order to have a project that's, that has many contributors, it's important that these contributors feel that the project represents them or it does something for them. It it, mm. it it represents what they want to achieve. So you can't have a dictator of a software project that says we're going to go left while all the contributors say, no, we want to go right. That's why mm. we're here. So in that way, an open source software project really becomes a decentralized product as well. It becomes a decentralized phenomenon where no single person can be in charge and it's this you know, community of maintainers that collectively decides what it is or what what it should. So there's this very decentralized aspect to that as well, which I think is also relevant to Bitcoin. I can't be a dictator of Bitcoin. It's just impossible. You need to have this, it needs to be this decentralized project. So that's 
Yeah. So there's different yeah. ways that the hacker culture is very relevant for Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, so so the thing, the a very important point I think uh, in sort of like describing the history as you have is that free and open source software what predates commercial software, which I think a lot of people have it backwards. They think, okay, well, these companies started making it and then open source came on the scene and like uh, made alternatives or something like that. It's actually like reading your book. It's very clear that software started out as a collaborative open source thing. And it's only later with the commercialization of companies like Apple and Microsoft and many like that, 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 that it became proprietary, closed source and so on. And as you point out, like once you close source the software, you essentially have a trusted third party. Uh, every user has a trusted third party that they, that, uh, you know, they're, they're at their mercy, right? And uh, how many times have we seen these trusted third parties leak your data or, uh, or do something nefarious or, you know, do, do all kinds of things. And, and this, is, this is sort of like that tension between the open source and uh, commercial movements that, that you lay out in the book of, okay, like, how do you make secure software if it's, uh, if it's not open source? And if it is open source, like, how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you rule that? And uh, just to be fair, like, there, there are lots of open source projects where you have, quote unquote, benevol benevolent dictators for life and so on. So, I mean, like... There's different models, but the beauty of open source software is that you can fork it, right? Like you can you can make your own, and uh, right. many, many have. Uh, but let, yeah, let, I, I want to say yeah. one thing about that oh. because I did notice that I used the, the word collectivist during uh -huh. my explanation. Uh -huh. so yeah, just that's actually an important thing to point out. Like, mm -hmm. there's, it is obviously or naturally an opt-in thing, and anyone mm -hmm. can leave at any time. So it's not. Like collectivist in the statist sense, it's, it's yeah, very yeah, it, it's not. It's, it's collaborative more than collective, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that that would be the better word. Right. Uh, but okay, so we 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 have um, you know, you have the software movement, uh, you and then and then there there's sort of like a third thing. You have the cryptography movement that starts. Um, can you describe that and like what what innovation sort of led to uh, you know, the I guess the cypherpunk mailing list because there there was obviously some uh, some fights there as well like uh that like we're you know we we had a fight between hayek and uh, Keynes. we had a fight between you know uh open source and commercial and you get to cryptography tell me more about that yeah so um well crypt so cryptography is very old in itself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it's been used since like the roman times maybe before that mm -hmm. but f f throughout most of history there was always a very a fundamental limitation to so to uh, for private communication right that that's mm. the main use case uh the fundamental limitation was that you had to share a secret key mm. so the two people that wanted to communicate needed to both know this key and no one else could know it and that's how you could then have private com uh, conversations um now this is a problem so this made this kind of a thing that that's mostly useful for like armies. You had to meet in person first before you could use it. But mm -hmm. with the emergence of the internet, of course, it's not plausible that you're going to meet everyone in person first. Uh, so something new was basically needed. And Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman as well in the 70s, they believed that this was possible. There were also rumors that this technology existed within like secret uh free letter agencies the nsa specifically yeah, I, apparently the nsa developed something in 71 or something but they couldn't reveal that they did <laughs> well the the british secret service did the NSA, oh, okay. not, maybe, maybe not it as far as we know somebody somebody developed it before. but there were rumors that the nsa had something like that as well mm -hmm. and so cryptographers sort of knew that that was maybe the case including Whitfield Diffie, who was one of these uh, hackers, he came out of this MIT hacker mm. culture. And he believed, look, if we're going to have communication worldwide, like an internet, then it's important that people can communicate privately. It, it's not, you don't want to live in a world, an Orwellian world. You don't want to live in a world where the government can tap into every conversation, see what everyone is saying at, at, at any time. It's a very scary idea. So Whitfield Diffie believed that it was possible to have private communication without having met each other first. And he was very annoyed that the NSA probably had it, but wasn't sharing it with 
you know the rest of society like it's a government funded it's a you know publicly funded institute and this is such an important thing for humanity that he kind of became very bothered so he went on this mission to discover what what this technology was and how it works and this led him to martin hellman and then they start to think about uh, together also um ralph merkel sort of became part of their brainstorm sessions he ralph merkel was still a student at the time uh, martin hellman and which would if he were a little bit older like in their late 20s i believe and at some point they figured it out so they figured out public key cryptography so as probably many of your listeners will know now there was not one private key that both people had to share but each individual has two keys so a public key and a private key you share the public key you keep the private key and that's how you can communicate securely on top of that it also allows you to cryptographically sign documents it can, you can prove that you did, you know signed the document that it was you the owner of that public key and no one else so now you could pro, prove you know ownership or you... um and this was a really big breakthrough this really sort of blew the minds of all cryptographers especially like the younger generation were very inspired by this and this unleashed a cryptographic revolution and from there a whole bunch of technologies were developed crypto technologies uh, so another example would be uh, remailers which is mm-hmm. the precursor to tor so a way mm-hmm. to, so with public key cryptography you can communicate anonymously mm-hmm. um, but through email so you can have anonymous emails for example but then the metadata metadata is still visible, right? You can still see mm. who was emailing who. And then with something like remailers, you could also hide that. It, mm. it goes through these several encrypted hops. So that was a, a, an example. Also, the Merkle tree was invented. And David Chaum developed a form of digital cash. So a way to essentially pay each other to mm. transfer value in an anonymous way. In his case, it was a product for banks. So banks could offer it to customers and then customers could make a withdrawal and then use their digital you know, coins as, as money. But, but it was backed by you know, the fiat currency that the bank was using. That was Chomp's technology. So there were all these technologies, but uh, starting from the 70s, throughout the 80s, the, there were all these academic papers, conferences, cryptographers that were coming up with new ideas. However, it really sort of stuck in the academic realm for a large part until in the early 90s, Tim May and Eric Hughes met. So this was a retired Intel uh, physicist, Tim May, and Eric Hughes who worked at David Chaum for a little, for a couple Mm -hmm. of weeks and then become disillusioned by the direction that the company was going for reasons I won't get into here. And they started talking with each other and they were speculating about the potential of all these tools. Tim May had very pretty radical ideas about sort of WikiLeaks types of uh, markets where information, secret information could be sold, which could undermine governments even, and that, that these kinds of ideas. However, they found and they thought, why is this not actually used by anyone? Like we have all these papers, we have all these conferences, but no one's actually using this. And then they set out, we, not, we need to realize this. We need to actually bring this to the public. And that's when they started inviting friends, hackers, uh, privacy activists, and they started to form this, I don't want to call it a club. Uh, you know, it was just come and go voluntary. It was a, a movement, I, I, I would say, a movement of people that wanted to develop free software that embedded these crypto tools and spread them so everyone could start to use them. So these were the cypherpunks. And the, and the uh, cypherpunks is sort of like um, a very eclectic group. But uh, a, as you were saying, they, they had this tension versus the academics, right? Like the, the, the people that were writing all of these papers versus, you know, the cypherpunks. And, uh, you, you know, you quote over and over again that uh, cypherpunks write code, right? Like that, that's sort of the, their thing is they make the practical mantra. implementations of all of these theoretical ideas. And... Uh, and, you know, they, they have this spirit of open source uh, software and things like that. Um, you, you create stuff like remailers. Um, you're, uh, you know, thinking about privacy. And it's, it's, uh, it's bring, and there, there's some, there's an extra 
group in the cypherpunks uh, that are way more sympathetic to, say, Hayek that also get in there. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about um, this very uh, weird group? I, I did not know at all about the extropians until I read this book. Um, and uh, it, it was, for me, quite fascinating how this group ended up a such such a big part of the cypherpunk movement. Can you can you talk a little bit about the extropians? Yeah, so the extropians, they were founded in the late 80s by mm. Max Moore. Mm. Original name was Max O'Connor. Mm. And Tom Morrow, and his original mm. name was Tom Bell. But mm. uh, uh, they had this... Uh, very futurist philosophy. They they had this very hopeful idea about the potential of technology. So this hopefulness about the future is sort of embedded in their names, Max Moore, tomorrow. <laughs> um, so they believed specifically that technological progress would continue to escalate, essentially, and technology would be able to, you know, uh, realize these super outlandish, uh, visionary, futurist ideas, like um, a, a big one was eternal life. So they thought technology like healthcare will develop to the point that all diseases can be cured and with like nanobots can go inside of your body and restore any damaged cells. And this is how you can cure aging itself. And so you can live forever. And then humans are going to upgrade themselves with like bionic eyes or, you know, robot arms or so you can well, lift so heavy I, 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 and... I, 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 These are sort of the ideas from like Ray Kurzweil and like singularity yes. and stuff like that. Um, and But like this, is, I don't know how popular he was at that time, but it, the, these sort of similar ideas seem to be and this um, sort of movement of extropians. Correct, yes. So, uh, but on top of that, there's an important aspect to the extropians, mm. which is how they believed this future could become a really reality. Mm. And they specifically, they were very inspired by Hayek's idea about the economy. Mm. They believe the best way for humanity to progress to this point is by leaving them alone, so to say, by, <laughs> by getting the state out of people's lives so people can freely, you know, experiment, um, explore, and the, the free market will figure it out. Like the, the, the subjective demands from individual people in the economy, they will drive this technology te technological revolution forward. So they want to get the state out of their lives. That was like a big part of their goal. And that's how they become interested in digital cash as well. Mm. So they started with Helvini, uh, mm. notably, and also um, now mostly Helvini, but Nick Zabo was also very early in this, mm -hmm. this community, uh, a digital cash um, focus. So Helvini made the case to the extropians that digital cash was a very important technology for them to focus their attention on, because with digital cash, you can get the government out of your money in a sense that they can't see who's spending what to who. It was mm. like this privacy argument. So this Xiaomi and digital cash uh, argument, which Helvini was indeed promoting, Xiaomi and digital cash. Mm. So he was really sort of focused on the privacy aspects as a way to reduce the role of government in your life. But then the extropians, they, they really liked that idea. But they also started to think, wait, but if we can have digital forms of money, then the potential is even greater. It's mm. not just privacy. It's also the denationalization of money. That's also something we can now start to realize with these technologies. So in this extropian movement, these ideas of privacy on uh, privacy for digital cash and monetary reform for digital mm. cash, they started to really merge. And Max Moore, for example, started to advocate to other extropians, let's you know, kill two birds with one stone. We need to create digital cash that embeds this Hayekian ideal while also offering privacy. And yeah, a whole number of the extropians turned then turned to the cypherpunk community or became cypherpunks or were already cypherpunks. Mm -hmm. So this includes, of course, Halfini and Nick Sabo, which I also already mentioned, mm -hmm. but also Tim May, one of the founders of the cypherpunks, was an extropian. Wide Eye, 
there, there was there was a whole bunch of overlap between these communities. Or in a way, you could say the cyberpunks was sort of a spin-off from the Extropians, it, it, or it sort of uh, partly came from the Extropians. Mm. Well, I, it seems to me that it's uh, cypherpunks are, uh, you know, like a merging of, uh, of many different kind of like groups, right? You, you have right. the cryptographers, the academics, um, you know, the Extropians, obviously, um, that, that are bringing sort of the economic aspect. And then you, you have a bunch of coders that are, that are like used to, um, you know, maybe, maybe come from a little bit of that hacker culture and then they, they all combine on the cypherpunk list. And, yeah, you're you know, absolutely you get... right. Yeah. It wasn't just Extropians to make that clear. It was like this broader yeah, collection of, uh, people that also had sometimes had pretty different, different ideology, ideolo- ideological reasons to be involved with the cypherpunks. So some of them were like Tim May was like a very anarcho-capitalist type of free market absolutist, if you if you want to call it that. But there were also someone like Halvini. While he liked the vision of Tim May, he didn't think it was very realistic. He had a much <laughs> more down to earth sort of uh, you know expectation of what this technology would accomplish. And then there were also some cypherpunks like Eric Hughes, one of the co-founders, who actually wasn't really a libertarian. He didn't see it as a libertarian thing. And he saw it more as a, you know, they had a shared goal, but not necessarily a shared ideology. It was a, it was a coalition in, in that sense of, uh, you know, different factions. In, in a yeah. Way. And, and there, there are other cypherpunks that you didn't mention in the book, but are like very different, right? You have Mark Andreessen and Julian Assange and, you know, uh, many others that like, they had their own reasons for getting on the list and they had their own reasons for being a part of it. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's hard to argue at this point that my country is, for example, like VC extraordinaire at this point, like, uh, you know, how, how much of the cypherpunk spirit he has, but, um, but moving on with, with the cypherpunk. So they, they, this list forms and it becomes kind of this crazy, um, you know, crazy, group uh that that keeps like creating code and remailers and pgp and all this other stuff uh talk a little bit more about how that led to bitcoin or what what all the precursors within the cypherpunks uh were for bitcoin itself yeah so the cypherpunks wanted to create digital cash that was mm. one of their main mm. goals maybe even their main goal you could say mm. that's something they really wanted to achieve and at first, they were approaching this from the Xiaomi way, so the mm-hmm. technology that was built for banks, essentially, that's offered the privacy. Um, but uh, Xiaomi's technology was uh, patented, so they mm-hmm. couldn't just use it. And then, of course, some of the cypherpunks were also interested in monetary reform, which Xiaomi's mm-hmm. system itself did not do. Um, so that was sort of where they started off. But then over the years, they came up with new ideas to do it. Mm. So a big breakthrough was Adam Back's hash cash, mm. which was actually not exactly meant to be an electronic cash, even though it has cash in the name, but it was more meant to be a postage system. Mm. But yeah, something to a sort of attach value, proof of work in, mm. in any case, to emails. And this was uh, the, the specific reason they wanted to develop that was because spam was becoming a big, big problem and mm. remailers were being spammed a lot. So, they were maybe under attack or so there was it was needed that it would be a cost to using a remailer so something like postage but this idea of postage introduced essentially something aching to digital scarcity so now mm. all, for the first time you had something that was both digital but still hard to produce so there was a mm-hmm. real world cost to producing this it was a real world you know, energy that you had to invest in order to make proof of work. So, so there was this inherent scarcity to it. And this concept inspired some of the other cypherpunks to build on it and build build it out into electronic cash systems. Mm. So there were a couple of notable proposals. The notable proposals that I outline in my book were Nixabo's BitGold, mm. uh, WideEye's B-Money, and then Helvini's Arpau. Mm-hmm. And they're all a bit different uh, in certain ways, but they all have this idea of using proof of work to create currency, so some embedded scarcity. 
and then they had different approaches to dealing with um, countering the double spend problem. Mm -hmm. So how can you make sure that you can send the same coin to two people at once and people are going to disagree on who owns what? And uh, how you deal with the inflation issue. So mm. if you just use proof of work, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to produce. And you get sort of this technological inflation, if you want to call that. It's not a good property for money to have. So they had different ways of sort of trying to tackle that problem. Or, you know, in, in our Arpao's case, he didn't really, he kind of ignored the inflation problem. But they, there's different designs they came up with. But throughout these different designs, you can really start to see sort of pieces of the puzzle that, that Bitcoin later used. So proof of work is, of course, an obvious piece of the puzzle, but then also transferring ownership using public keys. Also, uh, you know, run your own node, basically, was something that's wide eye Distributed ledgers, right? Like a wage yes. eyes thing, yeah. Right, that's something wide eye introduced. And so they came up with, you could even argue that something like, uh, you know, second layer technologies. Mm -hmm. Today we have lightning and... Mm -hmm. Liquid and, and these kinds of technologies, Nixabo was already thinking in this direction to have like a payment layer on top of a base layer. So you can see all these pieces of the puzzle in these earlier technologies. So yeah, that's why, like the that, that as you mentioned at the start of the podcast, that's why the book is sort of written. Or you can sort of see that Bitcoin did not come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Did not come out of nowhere. It's it's sort of this collection of puzzle pieces that was brilliantly put together by Satoshi. But they all sort of existed before that in these other digital cash projects or also in non-digital cash projects like the timestamping mm -hmm. server that um, that was invented in the 80s mm -hmm. um, by uh, Scott Sornetta and Stuart Haber, That's also, and which is mentioned in the white paper as well. That, that's uh, very influential. And that, that, that was design. an important one, this, this idea of chaining and, uh, and that, that made it obviously into, into Bitcoin as well. Um, uh, but uh, going back to the cypherpunks, um, you 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 have PGP, you have stuff like that. The the character you focus a lot on is Hal Finney, and he seems to pop up everywhere, right? Like he's like helping uh, Phil Zimmerman with PGP, and he's like leading. He's reading everything. You know, he's uh, you know he obviously does reusable proof of work. He reviews pretty much every digital eCash thing that comes on the list. And uh, unsurprisingly, when uh, Satoshi releases Bitcoin, you know, he's, you know, there, there's this, there's the famous tweet of him saying running Bitcoin, right? Like that's the first instance of anybody mentioning it on Twitter. Um, but uh, he, he seems to be this interesting figure that has this extropian background, is obviously a competent, uh, and if not extraordinary uh, coder and developer, and has enough, um, you know, like, cryptographic understanding to come up with like a lot of stuff. Can can you talk about him a little bit and how he ends up contributing to Bitcoin and how he sort of almost in a way kind of legitimatized it for at least a few people. Yeah, Helvini is like a true legend in my mm. eyes. Mm. Uh, yeah, he was uh, an early extropian mm. and cypherpunk. So he was one of the ex uh, cypherpunks that came from the extropian community. Uh, started out as a game developer mm. uh, and yeah he became very interested in digital cash so he also saw that as you know his his vision he, he had this grand vision for the internet he recognized the potential of the internet early on but he also recognized the risks of the internet very early on so mm. The, the this dystopian future where no one has privacy mm. so he became very interested in digital cash uh, meanwhile, as you mentioned, he also worked for PGP. He, he mm. contributed a lot to the PGP uh, software and remailers, as you also mentioned. So yeah, he was mm. very active in that sense. But Digital Cash was always um, one of his main goals. And indeed, it's like any time someone would come up with a Digital Cash proposal on the on the Cypherpunks mailing list, he was there. He he was just interested, and he wanted to learn how it worked, and then he would explain to others how it worked, and uh, positive, like always sort of a positive attitude, always looking at stuff that were interesting and that could potentially work. And and this positive sort of um, attitude, which everyone who knows him always mentioned that, like mm -hmm. he was such an uplifting spirit. And, um, and that still persisted even after the cypherpunk culture basically 
died down in a way. Mm. So it, the cypherpunk culture kind of died down by the early 2000s. It, it migrated mm. to Usenets and it, 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 and the digital cash dream sort of died. And this was also in large part because it turned out that no one cared. <laughs> the cypherpunks well, well, were I mean, learning. Digi, Digicash went bankrupt, right? Like they, yeah, they, that, Digicash went bankrupt in part. Well, there's different stories about why, mm -hmm. but it's pretty clear that there wasn't great market for it, mm -hmm. whatever the reason was. Like people just didn't seem to care so much. Mm. People were just happy using credit cards or PayPal, PayPal. or they, yeah, they were they weren't really concerned about their privacy on the internet. Mm. So the cypherpunks that have been building all these technologies and you know brainstorming about how to bring all these free software tools to the people were becoming disillusioned because apparently no one cares. They were doing it all for nothing. That's, that was sort of a pervasive feeling. But not Helvini. Helvini kept optimistic and he kept excited when he when he learned about something new. And he even implemented his own digital cash project in these like years after most people had sort of given up, he, he still came up with our power. Again, no one cared, by the way. Mm. Although Greg Maxwell cared, he was <laughs> he was around at the time. He, he was I, I didn't expect him to pop up on that, but that that was interesting yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, uh, a famous core developer, of course. For mm -hmm. you know, in, in case you have a listener somewhere who doesn't know who Greg well, uh, Maxwell is, among other things, <laughs> right? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant core dev. Um, where was I? So yeah, our pal again. No one really cared. Uh, you would think, you know, maybe this is a time to sort of give up and become disillusioned. But <laughs> nope, not not hell, because then in 2008, uh, Satoshi, you know, proposes Bitcoin on the mailing list, and mostly everyone is either ignoring it or skeptical. Mm. Uh, you know, mostly focused on why it couldn't work. There were some valid critiques as well, by the mm -hmm. way. I, that's also worth pointing out. Like, I think the very first response was about the limited scalability of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which is a problem we're still dealing with. But uh, also just emails that didn't really understand it. And mm -hmm. clearly a lot of people that didn't really care. But hell, again, he saw it and he saw the potential and he thought it was interesting. And so, yeah, he was sort of the first... Um, yeah, he... he uh, yeah, he kind of vindicated Satoshi in, in what he was doing. But then more importantly, of course, when Bitcoin was released, Helvini was also, again, one of the first that started using it. Recipient of the first Bitcoin transaction started to help Satoshi out with like bug fixes and ideas of how to improve it. Started to brainstorm about, indeed, ways to improve Bitcoin. Like in the first couple of weeks, uh, things were still... Um, dealing with today i think another famous so the running bitcoin tweet is mm -hmm. uh, famous and i think he also had a tweet about privacy about how to improve privacy and he had a, a tweet about the energy use of bitcoin I, I believe that that's all helvini in like the first couple of weeks of bitcoin so and then in the years after that he kept like in his contributions I call him, the not in my book, by the way, because mm -hmm. my book ends where Bitcoin begins. Mm -hmm. But there's this very early Bitcoin talk post by Helvini about why a successor of Bitcoin couldn't succeed. And it's mm -hmm. really sort of the maximalist mm -hmm. uh, argument, or at least the maximalist argument that I find the most compelling. It's this idea that if it happens once, what's to say it doesn't happen again and again. And the idea of digital scarcity is just completely destroyed. No, it can only happen once, really. Mm. So he can, he you know fill, figured it out in like 2009. So yeah, just just a very, from what I hear, like a great person and a brilliant mind. And it, he was kind of Bitcoin's first follower. Like me, mm -hmm. people have maybe seen this sort of. There's this viral YouTube video mm -hmm. about the first follower. So people always yeah. look at who's the leader of a movement. But then this video of this dancing people at a festival really shows that it's not just about the leader, it's also about the first follower. So in that context, the first guy that starts to dance with this crazy guy dancing on his own. And then that first guy is sort of vindicated and now more people want to join. And mm. now it becomes a movement. The first follower sort of proves that the, the leader is not crazy and opens the door for other people to come in. So it's sort of a, a, an underrated aspect to, to a, a cultural movement. And Halvini was, I would say, Bitcoin's first follower. Yeah, I, I have a small story about how I've, I've never met him, but um, but I, I was working on some elliptic curve optimization on BTCD many years ago, and uh, 
and I found out I, I found a post on uh, Bitcoin Talk about him making that exact same optimization, right? Like, and it, it's not a trivial one. It, it, it like you ha- uh, you have to refer to some obscure, you know, um, um, you know, journal article about how you could. Uh, you know, make uh, an elliptic curve operation much faster by uh, reducing the size of the bits and using this endomorphism or something. I, it took me like, I was a math major. It still took me like a week to understand it. He he just had posted it. He he figured out, okay, yeah, this is what you can do. And this is the paper I read and here's how you can optimize it. Uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. Like to for him to have, uh, you know, fish that, article out from somewhere, figure out that it would be relevant for Bitcoin and implement it. Not a trivial undertaking. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you sort of showed the influence that he had because I, I don't think most people understand just how important he was, not just to Bitcoin, but to the entire prehistory of Bitcoin, the, the cypherpunk movement and so on. And I, I'm, I'm so glad that he gets his due. Um, all right, so let, let's uh, let's sort of like talk a little bit more about uh, the cypherpunk movement and the cypherpunk ethic. And um, you know, th- this is not part of your book, but uh, but how that sort of like become a part of the Bitcoin movement, right? That that ethic of a cypherpunk's code and um, sort of making practical realities. Because at least in my interpretation of how you've laid this book out, and I think it's fairly accurate. Is that much like uh, Hayek, where he had this like valley of the shadow of death in the 40s, 50s and 60s, where, you know, like you just sort of had to wait until like people started caring about it again. Uh, The cypherpunk movement kind of went through that in the in the 2000s and maybe even part of the 2010s, where like people didn't care about privacy, but then it got worse and worse and worse. Right. You had the Facebooks and Googles and you know, Apple, like just taking all your data and selling it and like getting everyone getting hacked and fished and all that stuff. So people started caring about it again. And uh, among others, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin obviously has benefited from like people desiring that. Um, but uh, but how, how do um, how did how does the how does Bitcoin sort of continue in this cypherpunk tradition? And in what ways is it like uh, kind of getting commercialized or maybe, uh, you know, how are people trying to take it over and what can we do um, as a community uh, to sort of like um, do what the cypherpunks did and sort of resist the uh, the takeovers, the you know, or even going back to the hackers, right? Like the the corporate takeover, the trusted third parties and so on, because that, that's... I. Um, obviously fairly relevant now with all the ETFs and so on. Yeah, I do think there's a relevant lesson in that regard to learn from the cypherpunks and from that era. So what what you're referring to is that we, in Bitcoin, we increasingly see this regulatory overreach, hmm. like all this KYC, AML, like it, it, it should be normal that people can transact privately, but somehow... It, it's getting lost. It's getting lost that privacy is a human right. And the fact that Bitcoin offers privacy to some extent is considered a big problem and it's all being bordered shut, basically. Like it's becoming harder and harder to use Bitcoin privately. Mm -hmm. And I think the way to fight back against that, there are good lessons to be learned from the 90s because in the 90s you had the crypto wars Mm -hmm. and the crypto wars was essentially an attempt by the U.S. government to limit the use of cryptography. Um, this was fought, and it was fought in part by the cypherpunks, but not only the cypherpunks. So it was the cypherpunks, uh, it was human rights groups like the ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, these kinds of organizations, and also commercial parties mm-hmm. because they saw their profits um, being harmed. And what you saw is that this sort of multi-front war emerged. So you had the commercial parties, the Netscapes that said, look, we can't do business in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, This is harming us and therefore ultimately the tech sector in the United States and therefore the United States itself. Like it's not a good thing to impose all these rules on us. And then you had the human rights groups that were making the argument for privacy. And then you had the cypherpunks 
that just did it. That cypherpunks write code, and they were sort of this radical arm of of this broader movement. They were, you, you know, going to stick it to the man. They were just going to do it. And through this sort of multi-front war, the, the crypto wars were eventually won. The restrictions were loosened or just uh, abandoned altogether. And cryptography became, you know, a legal thing to use. Uh, so the analogy in Bitcoin today, I would say, is now with all this AML, KYC, all this, all this, uh, you know, horribly privacy encroaching um, uh, regulation that we see being rolled out. I think the way to fight against that is something similar. So we do need also commercial parties need to make it clear that this is harming their business. So in the Netherlands, where I live, where I'm from. We have a good example of that, where the biggest uh, Dutch exchange, Bitonic, they they sued the um, central bank because the central bank was imposing AML KYC rules that went far beyond what was reasonable, and Bitonic was able to win that. Uh, in Bitcoin, we also, of course, now have organizations like the Human Rights Foundation, so human rights aspect that are starting to involve themselves with this debate, and then what we also need to have is sort of this radical group you know bitcoiners that will just say we'll just build this we'll just build this software we're going to use it whatever your opinion is it's free and open source software and try to stop us and i think through this multi front war that that's sort of how bitcoin can and privacy can potentially win this new anti privacy war as well hmm. okay so i i i think the takeaway should be that um you know, we we need to resist uh, some some of the uh, some of the tyranny, and uh, we we have some tools to do it. And in a, in a sense, uh, government overreach, I think, is has been there the entire time. Um, you know, going all the way back, um, you know, to the beginning of the book, right? Like all, all of the monetary um, sort of shenanigans that they pull, and that that's just part of how they try to uh, control us or make us do what they want and not really leaving us alone. Uh, and having that ethic of, uh, of doing something, having some agency and going and coding and making stuff, um, that, that's the ethic that, uh, that hopefully uh, a lot of Bitcoiners take to heart and you know, don't just sit around, but like make, make the reality of what you want to see happen. Um, I, I, I really want to thank you for this book, because I, I, I think uh, for a lot of people, they really don't understand that there is a deeper and more interesting history of Bitcoin than they could ever imagine. Uh, and in a sense, it's a it's a long, slow burn before you get to the actual thing that is Bitcoin. And it it, uh, it bursts onto the scene and actually for the first year or so, like nobody does anything with it. Um, but then it it starts taking off and uh and you know we're we're at where we're at now right like it's uh, it's been 15 years um and it continues uh because of uh you know like honestly the work of people like Hal Finney who unfortunately has passed away and you know but but had uh, a significant part in creating this freedom technology so um Hopefully you guys can all get this book. I, I really have to tell you, I, I haven't seen a book that merges all of these aspects in this historical way. I, I really do think that many years from now, people are going to be studying this book to get an idea of the origins of Bitcoin, because I, I believe that Bitcoin will be a major, major part of society. And people are going to want to know where it came from and how it developed and, and, and so on. And, uh, and this, this will be one of the, one of the great resources for a lot of people. Uh, so get ahead of the pack. Go, go read this book, go buy this book. Um, I can't recommend it enough. I, I read it in like a 20 hour plane ride. Um, I did sleep in between and stuff, but you know, like it, it was, uh, you, you can, you could get through it in maybe a couple of days if you're, if you're reading decently fast. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to thank you for the book. Um, where can people find you? Where can people contact you? And, you know, so on. Yeah, well, f first of all, thanks for these mm -hmm. very nice words. I mm -hmm. appreciate it. Uh, people can find me on Twitter. I'm at Aaron Van W. And then in my bio, you can also find my Noster mm -hmm. pop key. Uh, for the book, it's thegenesisbook.com. Or you can just find it on Amazon or
probably some other bookstores. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, Bitcoin Magazine, right? Like, they... oh, I forgot. How can I forget Bitcoin Magazine? Yeah, the Bitcoin Magazine store, obviously. <laughs> yeah, there's also uh, for the Dutchies on ball, ball.com. The Dutchies will know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But but go get this book. Um, and it's been doing pretty well for a reason. Uh, it's very easily readable. Um, you know, page turner and lots of stories, lots of characters that. Uh, you might not even realize you uh, you, you would uh, was were involved in all of this. So, um, so good good stuff. Uh, thank you, Aaron, and um, and yeah, um, let's thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. All right, let's. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin-native financial services partner, learn more at Unchain.com.